So our first talk now is by Haya Sweeney. Right yeah. <laughs> and it's um, using fundamental pain to explain jet physics. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Payaswini Saikia, a PhD student from Redbout University Nijmegen, working with Elmar Kjerding and Heino Falke. And today, I will be talking about the black hole fundamental plane and how we can use it to constrain blazar jet physics. Speci specifically, I will be talking about constraining blazar Lorentz factor distribution. So to start with, I will give an introduction of the fundamental plane. Okay. Uh, in the universe, we have black holes of a vast mass range, starting from the smaller stellar mass black holes to the supermassive black holes, which are hosted in active galactic nuclei. Now, despite many differences between them, we see that the central, uh, the central region of the black holes are similar. They have a black hole and an accretion disk around it and a relativistic jet coming out of it. So naturally, it is, it's important to ask this question, is it, are the active galactic nuclei just scaled up black holes of the galactic black hole extra binaries? So in the extra binaries, we see that there is a very tight correlation for the hard state extra binaries between the extra luminosity and the radio luminosity. Now here I'm showing the best studied hard state extra binary GX3394. On the x-axis is the jet, uh, the jet power which is shown by the radio luminosity. And on the y-axis I'm giving the x-rays which shows the accretion rate. The x-rays are in 2 to 10 kV range and the radio luminosity is in 5 gigahertz. And we see that there is a tight correlation between the x-ray and the uh, radio luminosity showing a disk jet coupling. Now, do we see the same thing also in the active galactic nuclei? Well, we do see here in the uh, colorful points, you can see the active galactic nuclei. We do see a correlation between the x-ray and the radio luminosity, <coughs> but for a given x-ray luminosity, we see that the active galactic nuclei have a higher radio luminosity compared to the extra binaries. But all these correlations come, we can combine all of them together by adding one more dimension to our analysis, and that is the mass of the black hole. So here, what I have changed is the y-axis, where I have changed, I have scaled the extra, um, the extra luminosity with mass, and what we see is that uh, these extra binaries and the supermassive black holes, all of them show the same kind of correlation. And that is the basis of the fundamental plane of black hole activity. So basically, this fundamental plane of black hole activity is a 3D plane stretched out by black holes of the complete mass range in the 3D space given by their radio luminosity, extra luminosity, and mass of black hole. Here in the y-axis is the radio luminosity, and in the x-axis is I'm showing the edge of the projection, so I have a um, mass scaling of the extra luminosity, and we see that the extra binaries and the supermassive black holes, they show the same plane, they show the same uh, correlation together. So now, previously in the fundamental plane, people have used extra emission to, um, to trace the accretion rate of the black hole which is good because it comes, very, uh, it comes from close to the black hole, but it will be equally interesting and also useful to find the plane using the O3 line emission too. Because O3 lines come from the narrow line region, which is far from the black hole, and it, it's not as beamed, and also we can observe the O3 line from ground-based <coughs> observation. So what we do, we use the O3 line emission, we use a sample of low luminosity AGN, uh, from Palomar Spectroscopy Survey, and we here, um, I'm showing here just the 3D snapshot um, of radio luminosity mass and O3 line luminosity. And we do see a kind of plane relation by the low luminosity AGN. So here the radio luminosity is 15 gigahertz, and the O3 uh, lines are taken from the Palomar Survey. So, okay. Till now it is fine, but if we want to include the extra binaries, then we need to have an estimate of the um, extra emission from this O3 line emission, <coughs> for which we use a Heckman et al. correlation, very simple one, to um, compare with the extra binaries. And um, here I'm showing the edge on view of the plane. So uh, this is just the low luminosity AGN, and the best fit plane with the low luminosity AGN, I have extrapolated it to the lower mass region. And now, 
without fitting, if I just plot the hard state X-ray binaries here, then what I see is something like this. Here I have the low luminosity Asian in red and the extra binaries without fitting in blue. And the red is just the best fit plane of the low luminosity Asian. So basically I show that even using the O3 line in the optical we can find the fundamental plane and the extra binaries agree completely to the uh, low luminosity Asian sample. So till now, good. But if I want to add the high luminosity, the flat spectrum blazers, then what we see is something like this. Here I have in green the VIPS sample from the blazers from the VIPS sample with available mass. So these are mainly flat spectrum radio quasars. And uh, we see a huge discrepancy between these two, which can be explained with two things. One is the relativistic beaming of these objects. And the second is the lower flux limit of VIPS, which is 85 millijanski for 8.5 gigahertz. So the question that we ask is, we have the theoretical understanding from the fundamental plane. We know how the radio luminosity should be. And we have the observation from the VIPS sample. So using this information, can we constrain the jet Lorentz factor distribution? For that, we need to understand the relativistic beaming. In a very simple slide, uh, the observed luminosity depends on the intrinsic luminosity of the source, the boosting index P, which depends on the type of the jet, and also at its spectral index, and finally at the kinematic Doppler factor, which depends on the bulk Lorentz factor or the jet speed, and the angle to line of sight or the inclination of the blazer. Now the problem is, for individual blazers, it's very hard to, to calculate the bulk Lorentz factor and the angle to line of sight. But we can at least find a kind of, using the population, statistically a Lorentz factor distribution, which people have done before and have, although it's not completely established, but they have found that it should be a power law kind of distribution for um, the, gamma, uh, the gamma factor. Um, but we don't know exactly what should be the uh, index of this power law and also the gamma minimum and gamma maximum, although it's um, almost from 2 to 50 or 5 to 40 or something like that. So what we do, we take the intrinsic luminosity from the fundamental plane. And then we take for a continuous jet case with a um, flat spectra, so alpha to be zero. And we use a theta distribution uniform from something zero to 30. And uh, just to check, we take previously used power law distribution with a gamma of minus two. And we simulate a sample, we boost a sample, theoretical sample from the intrinsic luminosity as in the fundamental plane. And we want to compare it with the observed one. Do they actually overlap their radio luminosity? And what we see is this. In the green, where the previously shown observed VIPS sample, and in orange, I'm showing the uh, fundamental plane boosted sample, the simulated one, and they do overlap. And we want to statistically uh, quantify these similarities and for this minus two uh, Lorentz factor distribution, this is what we see. In the red is the observed radio luminosity distribution, and in blue is the simulated radio luminosity distribution. If we do a case test with the null hypothesis that both these populations are coming from the same underlying distribution, then we find a p-value of 0 0.63, which is high enough for us not to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so. Can we constrain the blazer Lorentz factor distribution more using this? Okay. Um, well, we tried. We used the gamma minimum of one, and here I'm plotting, um, I simulate the sample for different gamma maximum values and for different gamma distribution power law index. And I'm plotting the KSP values here. So all the blue points here are very low KSP value for which I can reject the null hypothesis that these two simulations, that the simulated sample and the observed sample are coming from the same distribution. Uh, so we look for mainly these points, and if I fix also the gamma maximum value, then I can put more constraint on the gamma distribution Lorentz factor, uh, the Lorentz factor distribution power law value. So here, in the x-axis, I have the power law index, and in the y-axis, I have the KSP values, and um, for a gamma range of 1 to 40, I'm showing the p-values here. And for all the small p-values, that means these, we can completely reject the null hypothesis. So mainly for these points, I can get the simulated sample and the observed sample to match.
So here I can, uh, we can say that we can constrain the Lorentz factor distribution for a gamma range of 1 to 40 to be in a power law of minus 1.8 plus minus 0 0.3. So to finally summarize, we report the optical fundamental plane of black hole activity using the O3 line emission. We show that this plan can be uniquely established just using the low luminosity AGN sample. And finally, we can use it to constrain the blazer lorentz factor distribution. We have done it till now just for the VIPA sample, and we have shown that for a gamma range of 1 to 40, we can constrain it for a power law of minus 1.8 plus minus 0 0.3. But further, we will be using other uh, samples with um, available black hole masses, and we will be looking to constrain it further. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Person, I have one. Uh, can you show me that fundamental plane line? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want for the optical one or the? The, the last one, where you showed that. Uh, yeah, this is one. Yeah. See, well, you're right that uh, for the blazers, you say that due to beaming. Am I right? Yes. So, why do you need to take gamma and theta? See, when it's a beaming, what comes is a Doppler factor delta. Yes. Correct? So, instead of. You, I can see you are taking gamma as well as theta and try to vary it. Yes. Instead, you can just use delta <laughs> and try to bring it back to the line. And then you can see what are the possible values of theta. Is it right or I'm um, wrong? Yeah, it is right. But uh, do we actually know a Doppler factor distribution for the blazers, which is established? I'm, I might not actually know this. No, the point is you're, you will get the information about your Lorentz factor and theta. <laughs> Pardon? No, not for each source, no. No, no, you don't need it. Because if you say it's a beaming, yes. the beaming, when you see the emissivity, when you get at uh, the observed level, hmm. what comes is only the delta. Yes. What comes to, when the boosting, when you say, hmm. it comes only delta. You don't need the information of gamma and theta. Yeah, that is so, right. So we can yeah. either find uh, the Doppler factor distribution right. or the Lorentz factor distribution and the theta. No, just the Doppler, uh, Doppler distribution. And you, is it better? Can I see only Doppler factor distribution? What is the to yeah? I can back show the what line. the Doppler factor distribution for this sample should be. I yeah, have that yeah. slide. Just a second, please. Yeah, I have many extra slides. I'm really sorry for that. Yeah, <laughs> this is the Doppler factor distribution that is needed for the VIPA sample if we if we take the fundamental plane to be true. Right. I believe this distribution you got from your gamma and theta. Am I right? Um, no, this distribution I got just by using the VIPS sample observed luminosity and the cool. fundamental plane intrinsic okay. luminosity. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So in the fundamental in the fundamental plane, the the ratios of the different of the two terms. Is there any way to understand why they should be like point eight or point whatever you showed? Uh, um, well. People have actually worked on that before, and um, I, I don't think that we can completely theoretically explain it. But at least um, the normal, the, cano the canonical jet model, we can get uh, some of those uh, numbers. Okay. We can constrain them well, but it's not completely theoretical. So this is just a fit of uh, data? Right? Yes, yes. Uh, did you uh, look for the effect of redshift in your correlations uh, by either looking at flux density, flux density plots, or by doing a partial coefficient? Yes, yes, um, yes. Of course, because it can be a complete distance distance plot because we have the luminosity. So we did um, uh, we did the partial correlation with using the upper limit, the Ecritas, um partial correlation um, test, and we got uh, something like. 0.55, if I'm not wrong, for the correlation to be true. So, yeah, so we can say, I think, safely that it's not a distance artifact. It should not be. Thank you. Okay. I think you was next, and then Robert. Um, uh, so, so when you corrected for the beaming, did you correct only the radio part or the X-ray as well? Or, or for uh, example, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. We used uh, we did only the radio part because uh, we are using the O3 luminosity of the blazers. So we have just so that we can compare it with the X-ray, we have uh, changed it to the X-ray. But otherwise, the O3 luminosity, I'm not sure if it should be as beamed as the X-ray luminosity or the radio luminosity. Okay. Robert, um, you're comparing the blazers with um, 
the rest of the points on this fundamental plane, which are all already determined from radio core luminosities. So shouldn't you beam incorrect those as well? Um, okay, but for blazers, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but for blazers, even if I look at the radio core luminosity, I'm using 8.5 gigahertz VLA uh, um, points for this. But still, we will see some kind of beaming in those. You'll see differential beaming, but my point is that um, the, the points that you're using to establish the fundamental plane mm -hmm. are core luminosities from objects which are probably at you know more benign angles to the line of sight, mm -hmm. but they're not 90 degrees. So um, yes. what you should do, in fact, um, is to try and figure out, I know it's difficult, the, um, the beaming corrections for, for the rest of the points there, because I think it will make a difference. Yeah, I will, I will actually check that. Thank you for that. But normally, because those were low luminosity AGN, so we thought that beaming should not make much of a difference. But Well, no, I mean, I, I think we know that it does, at least at the factor of 10 level. Um, hmm. Because, I mean, for example, the, the, the work we've done plotting various mem measures of asymmetry against core um, hmm. dominance um, it shows that there is a substantial variation across 90 to 30 degrees, for example, a, a, hmm. a factor of 10, 20, something like that. So it, it's you know it's not it's not much compared with what the blazars do, but it's not trivial either. May I ask one okay. quick question? Um, in your very first picture of the fundamental plane, where data come from the from the X rays, yeah. Um, what exactly does the um, X ray luminosity of M eighty seven mean in this context? Because as I showed, it's actually quite difficult to see the accretion disk in M eighty seven. Um, so what what are you plotting here as as as, as the accretion distance? Yeah, so here we have the extra luminosity for two to ten kV range, and it's. Um, well, I would argue for M eighty seven, and that's dominated by the jet. So you're plotting. Um, yeah, that's why it shows uh, quite a bit of um, difference from the normal plane. Yes. So this is the first first fundamental plane picture that we have got. So I have shown it, but later um, Elmar Kuerding and many Plotkin and other people have actually refined the plane using um, just some select selected sample of AGN. So yeah, I just showed it because it was the apparent like the first plot of the hey, fundamental plane. One final question at the back. Um, I might have missed this, but uh, do you see any kind of a preferred value of gamma in your distribution or uh, any division between low gamma versus high gamma? Or well, we see a power load distribution of gamma. Gamma is in the Lorentz factor, you mean, right? Say that again? By gamma, you mean the Lorentz factor of the jet? Lorentz factor, yes. OK, we see almost uh, a power law for 1 to 40. So we, uh, we see kind of preferred for low gamma factors, for example. Because it's a power law of minus two index almost, minus 1.8, so. Okay, we should move on. So let's thank Ampai Srimi one more time. <laughs>